you have your copy of God's Word, please open it back up to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. And we're going to pick up in chapter 1. And, and I'm, just, I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there for you. I do not like the book of Ecclesiastes. You don't like one of God's books of the Bible. Because it is just mystifying that this guy who is loaded, okay, think about it. Solomon had cash, he had land, he had power, he had, well, man, he had a boatload of wives and concubines. He had wisdom on top of that. He had everything. And then he writes you know, because obviously it's inspired of God. God had him write it. So we know that, that God wanted us to learn from his experience, from his wisdom. But I still, I just go, man, he is just whining. You ever meet people who just gripe about everything? Nothing is ever good enough for them. Well, it's because they have no meaning in their lives. Well, wait a minute. I'm a Christian, and, and I gripe too much. Is he talking about me? Mm, I don't know, but anyway. This guy whines, he gripes, he complains. But read a little more. And what you begin to find out is he is struggling with something every one of us struggles with, and that is meaning in our lives. And because he had wealth, position and power. He was able to explore everything while many of us never have the opportunity to go that far. And for good measure, I might add, that is for your protection. You ever wonder why some people are rich and you're not? There is a blessing to not being that wealthy because when we read the testimony of Solomon, King Solomon, you find out real quick, it's money does not fix your problems. Greater knowledge does not give you meaning. In fact, it compounds them and makes them more difficult. So when we pick up in the book of Ecclesiastes and, 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 and we begin to talk about meaning, we see in verse 2, he says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And, and I, I'm going to tell you something. I'm like, what, is that a sink or something? Why is he talking about that? I'm not the only, thank you. And that's where the NIV gets to win the day. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's what he's trying to say. So every time you read the word vanity, just go ahead and think in your mind, meaningless. Meaningless. Everything under the sun has been done. There's nothing new. And what you're going to find today, when we look at the life of, of King Solomon is no matter what you pursue, if it's not God, it's meaningless. If it's not God in his ways, his commandments, his plan, his purpose, it's meaningless. We only have a finite number of days on this earth, right? In fact, some of us who are younger, I like to call myself young still, some of us who are younger fool ourselves into believing that we have all the time in the world but every second that passes you can never ever reclaim it's gone it's gone just that simple and just that quick so I look at you this morning as we look at this and I ask you as a politician will ask you every four years, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Hey Christian, are you more mature in your walk with God than you were one year ago? Are you growing in Christ? I will tell you this. If you're stuck in a rut, living a meaningless existence, just wasting time with video games, TV, 
work and all of these other things. Some of them are good. Don't miss this. But you're not serving the greater God, the kingdom of God. You're not serving for the greater good, which is what God has set forth before us. You are wasting your life. So let's pick up. He starts talking about things that won't satisfy. Now, his first chapter, first 11 verses, he's going to say, look, everything, everything is meaningless. There is nothing there. We don't get it. There's nothing new under the sun. And then 12, he starts picking up, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, he starts picking up on wisdom, okay, and, and the futility of it, how he desired it, and he pressed before it. Verse 16, he says, I myself behold, by the way, you're going to need your Bible out and be ready to flip or scroll or slide or whatever it is you do. Because if you don't have a copy of God's word, you're just taking my word for it. And I promise you, this is the authority. Okay? God, just do this. It's Baptist amen for you new folks. All right? Okay. Listen. He, 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 so, so verse 16, we're in chapter 1, 16. And he says, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all those who were over Jerusalem before me and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and I have set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly I realize that this is also striving after the wind this idea of striving the wind you can't catch the wind you can't grab the wind you can't stop the wind you can't control the wind right Okay, so when he says this is striving against the wind, that's what he's talking about. It, he realizes in his pursuit of wisdom to fulfill meaning and purpose, to do something great. He's coming to understand that it's just like striving after the wind because you can't know it all. And in fact, there's a danger with knowing too much. It says, listen, verse, verse 18, it says, because in much wisdom there is much grief and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. I'm going to tell you part of the reason and this is not me trying to get on either side of the uh, <clears throat> immigration issue but part of the reason there is more immigration out of third world nations into Europe into the United States and the, and the like is because of satellite TV People were happy for the most part for a long time and then they saw what they didn't have. There's blissful ignorance, believe it or not. You know, when I was little and we were poor and I didn't have and I was playing in the dirt and using sticks as cars and guns and swords. Okay, I know you guys might not know what that's like because we're in the new age where those things are dangerous. We can't even do guns up if we're Texas Tech anymore. Okay? <sighs> Listen, look, man, I ate paint chips. So look at me. No. <laughs> You're welcome. Listen, it, ignorance can be bliss. It cannot be the end of all things. If, when I was little and we didn't have, I didn't know any better. I was happy. It wasn't until I had an opportunity to compare to other things to realize what I didn't have. And that's one of the dangers of living for what you've got and acquiring stuff. And you're going to say, well, wisdom is stuff. Yeah, wisdom is good. It can be used for great and wonderful things. But, you know, a lot of problems with Baptists is, is wisdom becomes the end all. Meaning I've been to Beth Moore 10 times and I've done, uh, I don't know, I don't know half the new, the, these new ladies, there's so many of them. I, I've done every study and I've done this and I've done that. I've never missed, I haven't missed Sunday school in 82 years. And you know the Bible backwards and forwards. But let me tell you something. Just having all that knowledge, if you don't ever use it, what good is it? So wisdom can be meaningless. Now he goes on and, and, and see, y'all talked about sex in um, Sunday school today, right? Uh-huh. 1 Corinthians 7. They might not have talked about it in the other groups, but I'm telling you in the adult groups, they talked about it. And... Um, Woo, just imagine if you, this was Youth Sunday and you had to teach that. I did, but anyway, listen. Look, look, he goes on into chapter two and he starts talking about his desire to test pleasure. His desire to seek 
all kinds of pleasures and it includes owning everything. That could be a new bass boat. That could be a new truck. That, that he, he was looking for pleasure in anything and everything that he could find. That could be traveling. That could be being a movie buff and going and watching every movie. Maybe your thing is to go and ride every roller coaster at every Six Flags in the nation. Okay? There are all kinds of pursuits of pleasure that you can chase after if you so choose to. He even went as far, I mean, and, and it says that he didn't he even provided himself with concubines and extra wives and all of that stuff. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know how that brought him pleasure because one is enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you hear that, dear? I love you. Seriously. Excess does not mean more. You know, this is, this is, this is why I sometimes think of this as the, 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 the Old Testament book of Catholicism. And I mean this in a good way. Everything in moderation. Excess is bad. Not enough wisdom? You're a fool. God wants us to have joy and pleasure, but in the right way. Because we need to know that we're, we're those who are being held accountable for our lives. Sometimes Baptists, we go too far extreme and we take the fun out of everything. God wants us to have pleasure and joy. We see here that in, let's see, it's uh, verse 9. He says, then I became great and increased more and more. And all who possessed in me, my, uh, uh, my wisdom also stood by me. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse from them. I did not withhold my heart. That's verse 10. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of what was pleased because of all my labor and all of all my pleasure. And this was my reward for all my labor. Then I considered all my all my activities which my hands had done, and that the labor I had exerted, going for pleasure, going for wisdom, doing all of these things, behold, all was vanity all was meaningless and striving after the wind and there was no profit under the sun so God doesn't want us to do anything well that's where chapter 3 comes in but see I, I when, when I read the book of Ecclesiastes when I read the book of Ecclesiastes I sometimes like I said I get called up and thinking that it's just this huge pessimistic story of this this wealthy um, this wealthy guy who's gotten everything whining and complaining. But what do we begin to learn? Excess is no good. Not enough is no good. But he comes to realize that God is in control. Chapter 3, we read it, or um, Chris was kind enough to read it for us as our scripture reading today. A time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plan, a time to approve. There's a time on earth for everything. God has appointed that time. He begins to realize something great is going on around him. And it is that God is in control. That God is able, but he's still struggling with it. Do you struggle in this life? I do. I worry about tomorrow way more than I should. I look for this, I look for that. I am here to tell you. I am here to tell you that it's comforting to know that God is in control. That the things that happen in life, whether, it's, whether someone dies, whether somebody is born, whether there is war, whether there is peace, that God is in control. That brings us comfort knowing that there is one greater. That will bring us meaning when we begin to explore that relationship. Verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9. He says, what profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I have seen the task which God has given to the sons of men which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in his heart. Yet, so that the man will not find out the work, find out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. So we start to get this idea that verse 10, it says, I have seen the task that God has given the sons of men. We were created with a purpose. We were created with a purpose and that brings meaning to our lives. 
Most men identify themselves as what they do for a living. Women are starting to do this more and more as, as we become in these directions. We, right now, I'm just, little, I'm just Larry's dad, okay? Nobody caught that? Has anybody got that same problem? You're just somebody's parent? It's going to become more and more, and then, then after a while they forget about you, but that's a different story. There's a task for us, every one of us. Now, is this passage trying to point ultimately to everyone in this room has to be a pastor, a missionary, or some kind of, you know, seminary professor, church planner? No. But it is saying that everyone has a task that God has laid before them that will give them meaning in their lives. It's setting up. It's going to the end. Remember, the answer's in the last two verses, okay, of the whole book. And that's where we're headed. So if you want to just go there, the sermon's over. Good night. All right? No, but seriously. But see, this is on the other side of the cross. We live on this side of the cross. What does that mean? Living on this side of the cross, Jesus has already come and fulfilled these things. We know that we have a purpose, and we're going to get more of that as we go. But let's look back to the other side of the cross. Before we knew Christ, every person made has a task which God has made them for. Whether it's being a Christian plumber, teacher, whether it's being a Christian mom, just to be a believer in that task. To serve God in those places of service. To bring Him honor and glory in every way. We'll get to more of that in a minute. But catch verse 11. He says, He has made everything in its appropriate time. Meaning He is in control. He is the one that keeps the earth spinning and all such things. He has also set eternity in their heart. He has set eternity in their heart. There's one of those great contemporary songs, and I don't even know the name or who sang it, but there's a God-shaped hole in all of us, is what it says. All of us were made to worship and know God. And when the fall of man took place, when sin came into the world, it left us all longing for Him. Every person on the earth is looking to fill that void with something. Many people, it's alcohol, it's drugs. Some people, it's, it, 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 it's women, it's men. Some people, it's money, it's power. Some, it's false gods and the like. For those of us that know Christ, we have filled that hole with the Holy Spirit and been made new. Remember, we saw the picture with Harper. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. When the Holy Spirit comes in to reside within those who believe in Him, that mark for eternity is fulfilled. We are made new so that we can have meaning in our lives, so that we can have purpose in Him. And, and we're going to get more into that, but, but notice He says, He has set eternity in our hearts. That's why the whole world is striving to know God. Many of them don't find him. Many of them go down the wrong road, so don't miss this. Oh, I should say most, huh? That's another sermon. Listen, he goes on though. I need you to understand that with meaning, when we find meaning in our work and we find God in that work, when we, when we see him at work, we will find joy there. What did Jesus say about what he was doing and when he was doing it? He would say, I look to see what the Father is doing and I just sit on, my, on, my, on the premises, on my rear, and I watch. Oh, come on now. I need something. No. What did Jesus say? He said, I go in, join him. I go and engage in that work. And why is that so important? Because we're supposed to do as the Father does. We're supposed to do as the Son does. If you want meaning in your life, it means we know Jesus Christ and then we look to see where God is at work and we go and join. Sometimes, we just do things because they're good things to do. We think, oh, hey, this seems like a good thing. I'll do that. 
But if God's not in it, is it good? Does it really have meaning? It's one of those things for your prayer closet to sit and spend time thinking about our activities, remembering where we are. But see, when we go to serve God, whether it's in Awanas, whether it's in the youth group helping out, Daryl always needs help, Awanas always needs help, Children's Church always needs help, Loving Arms always needs help. I'm just here to tell you, we always need help. And one of the reasons we want people to join is because we have such a safety system in this church for our children. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Is we want you to be members before we let you take care of our kids. You know, there's a little bit of safety there, but that's why we push for stuff like that. So that we can know you and know what we're about and all of that stuff. But again, there are so many opportunities to serve God. It's, and, and what happens is, let me, let me just be frank. I'm sorry, Frank's not here today, but Frank will be here next Sunday. Um, let me be frank with you. Some people sit so long in the same Sunday school class teaching or in children's church or this or that that the joy and the meaning of serving God fades away. They become bitter and rude. You see this, you don't see it as much in a big church like this because what do we do? We, well, there's so many people, people just quit and we just plug somebody else in there, right? But we sit in some of our smaller churches because some people have worked the books forever and they're just wore out and tired and after a while they've decided all the money's theirs. Hey, I didn't say it was right, but it's the reality. I've been in too many small churches. We need to come together and everyone serve together because we are the body of Christ. Hands, feet, knees, elbows, elbow, elbows, joints, ligaments, with Christ being the head. With Christ being the head, and you know what happens when we share the burden? You know what happens when we share the work, the meaningful work of God? 12, I know, verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's life. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. What's that next little phrase? It is a gift from God. When we're all doing our part, there is no burden too great, no task, no service in the kingdom that, that will overwhelm too much. Because God has called us together to serve together, to build up one another, to carry one another's burdens. Why should it be just a few who does all the service? Allow those folks to reclaim their joy and meaning in their service with a break. Work should be a joy when we serve. And notice he says that, that in verse 14, though, right after that, he says, I know that everything that God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it, for God has so worked that men should fear him. Now, listen, everything that is of God is eternal. Everything is of God is eternal. So that's meaningful. You know that property you've worked so hard to acquire and own? You know all the wealth that you have? Let me tell you. All the little collectibles that you love so much that you think your children and your grandchildren may want, you don't want to know what they're going to do. Oh my goodness. You're spot on. Y'all didn't hear it. Garage sale, estate sale. And you say, well, these kids won't do it. Your grandkids will. Your great-grandkids -grand might. Look, the stuff that we acquire on this old earth, it doesn't leave a legacy. Man, we're just renting it. Because if we're really honest, the government owns it. You're paying them every month, every year, right? I know, that's hard for you Van Zandt County people. Are y'all even a part of the United States anymore? <laughs> Sorry. Listen, listen, he, he says we'll last forever. What we do with our hands is, is short term. But when we come alongside and we serve Jesus to further the kingdom by making disciples who make disciples, by taking care of children. Listen, y'all may not know this, but when we got here to do our baptism, 
Baptism team was back there making sure that, that the parents were taken care of with the child. Everything was there. All of my stuff was laid out over here. The only person that messed up was me because y'all saw me running around about 10,000 miles an hour. Yeah, I forgot. It wasn't because of the people serving. What I'm trying to get at is, is there are many places to serve. They're not all up on stage, but every place in the kingdom is important and vital to furthering it. Listen, so he goes on and, he, and, and so join Jesus, join God in his work that matters. When you see the Lord work, when you start each day, say, Lord, help me, no. Now he goes on, listen, I gotta, get, I gotta speed this up a little bit. Did I tell you I just love the book of Ecclesiastes? <laughs> All right, so anyway, he talks about the follies of this and the follies of that. And he continues on, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 9. Chapter 9. And something we need to realize. When I talked about your stuff's not going to last, and I'm just going to reference it real quick, and then we're going to jump to chapter 12. But notice he says in verse, chapter 9, verse 5, it says, For the living now will know they will die, but the dead do not know anything. Not, um, do not know anything. Not have they any longer a reward now and their memory is forgotten now why am i bringing that up you're good for about two or three generations my children never met my mother so they'll know who she is in the pictures but the odds of their children knowing who my mother was is small. There is a legacy we can leave that is lasting and eternal. We got to celebrate that. Two parents getting to leave a legacy with their youngest child in baptism because that child received Christ as their Lord and Savior. There is a legacy when we join God in the work that He has called us to. Do you want meaningful work? Share the gospel with your friends and neighbors. Share the gospel with your grandkids and your great grandkids. Love your neighbor as yourself. You want to leave a legacy, that is one that has meaning. That is one that matters. Now he goes on and he talks about some really cool things. And one of the dangers, we got a lot of younger folks in this, 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 this service. And, I went long in the first one. I'm going to go long in this one, but this wasn't a point in the first one. So listen, verse 12. You in chapter 12? Am I getting you there? Chapter 12. We're going to do verse 1. Go ahead. Turn it. It's worth your time. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the days draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the zeal of life, before the thrill of life leaves you, serve God. Don't wait to focus on your creator until you're 30. That's not old, is it? <laughs> 40, 50, 60, 70. Because people all the time, they say, I'll serve God when I'm older. I'll serve God when I'm older. I'll serve God when I'm older. I'll make a difference then. Can I tell you something about time? Time is a diminishing resource. Every second that passes, you can never, ever reclaim. You want a meaningful life? Serve God. Serve God at every opportunity. I tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this. Serving God is more important than career ambitions. Serving God is more important than baseball, football, soccer, um, academic successes. Serving God is the greatest thing you can ever do. Because it is meaningful and it has eternal 
consequences and eternal significance. What did Jesus say? He says, don't, don't store your treasure where thieves can break in and steal it. He says, store your treasure in heaven. What kind of treasures get stored in heaven? Things that are eternal. Oh, let us bring it down toward the end. He, he, and, and see, this is, the, this is why this book drives me nuts. He goes back and forth, back and forth, all the way through it. And then he comes down to the end, verse 13. The conclusion, when all has been heard, when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Hmm. This is why this book is hard to preach straight through. Because at the end of every chapter, you've got to come right back to verse 13 and 14. At the end of the day, honor God, fear God, respect God, and obey his commandments. That is the key to a meaningful life. That is the key to what means something. Do notice, do notice that it applies to every person. Remember that stamp of eternity we talked about? That God-shaped hole that all desires? Listen, the person on the other side of the world that's worshiping Islam? Oh, wait a minute. There are those people right here in our town. They are held to this standard. Yahweh, his son Jesus is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And one day, all of us will stand before the judgment seat of God. Not my words, the Bible. And what will happen? Though we will all give an account of our lives, those who know Christ will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, there's a beam of seat in the judgment of our works, but we'll talk about that another time. But all of those who do not know Christ, their name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life. He will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And they will enter eternity in hell. I have one more verse for you this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You see, following the rules is not enough. It's not enough to have a meaningful life. There is only one who can change a life from meaningless to meaningful. 1 Corinthians 6, pick up in verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are, get this, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. We don't like that language because if somebody bought us, that means they own us. That means that Jesus is master, curious, Lord, and we are his servants. Do you want to have a meaningful life? Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this day and his precious blood which was shed on the cross will make, take your meaningless life and make it meaningful. For you have been bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus was shed to pay our debts. To pay for our sins. But as a result of receiving that gift, 
that gift of salvation, that, that, that gift of grace that we couldn't earn, that we weren't owed, therefore glorify God in your body. Everything you do and say, do on to the Lord. Are you more mature in your walk with Christ today than you were one year ago? If you're not, I ask you, what have you been doing with the precious commodity called time? God has given it to us. Not so that we may chase meaningless, purposeless excess, but so that we may bring him honor and glory through our service to him. If you are here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to come forward in our time of invitation to receive Christ for the first time, to call him Lord, to have a life that goes from meaningless to meaningful, to having life with a purpose. If you're here today and you need to recommit your life to Christ because you've been in living a life on your own, doing your own thing. And if you've been doing your own thing, whether you've been a believer for a hundred years, that means you've been leaving a, living a meaningless life, having a meaningless existence. Some of you here today have been saying, I'll do it when I retire. Lord, I will serve you faithfully when I attain my job career goals can I tell you something you weren't promised today so there is no guarantee for tomorrow our God calls us this day to be his servants let us pray